If we get back to the beginning for a little bit, talking about sanctions, you mentioned that the original expectation was that they could bring down the Russian economy by perhaps even 20%. And that didn't happen. Uh, you mentioned that the in 2022, it fell by one, maybe 2%. And this year, it might grow. Why didn't the sanctions work in the way that we initially expected them to? Did we have completely unrealistic expectations? Or is it that Russia is actually a lot better at evading the sanctions than we thought? I think it's that we, um, in some ways, we're giddy with their success. Um, you know, we saw everyone uh, outside the EU and the United States, um, not, not that every single country complied with the sanctions but um, or, or said that they would bring them in, in into their own legislation. Many countries, including a few Western allies, most notably Georgia, for example, have not, or, or Turkey, um, but that they really did cause the ending of key Russian business relationships across the West and internationally as well. And of course, sanctions uh, were introduced by some non-Western countries or countries at the periphery of the West that had hadn't done so before, Switzerland, South Korea, and, and Singapore, most notably. Um, so, you know, I, I think then sort of that set the expectation very high that, wow, this is really such a, a, a magic tool. Um, and then secondly, it was really an a failure to understand um, what exactly constitutes Russia's GDP and wealth and the Kremlin's ability to respond to that. Um, so, you know, let's take, for example, the sanctions on Russia's central bank, over $300 billion uh, of some $600 billion in its reserves, immediately frozen, still can't be touched by the Russian state today. Um, gas prices spiking, you know, th that $300 billion, however, doesn't get subtracted from Russia's GDP by doing that, mm. right? That's not, GDP statistics don't calculate that. Um, um, and then uh, the vast increase of gas prices, meaning that Russia was earning tens of billions a month um, from gas sales more than it had before, um, you know, the... That makes it look like, oh, well, you know, this is providing a huge boost to Russia's GDP. And then obviously this big detracting factor in the freezing of, of, of those um, sovereign assets doesn't um, immediately get done. So, you know, in some ways, I think it's more a reflection of... of um, the challenges in using GDP as, as a tool to calculate uh, everything in a country's um, economic performance, right? Um, you know, the uh, you, you can take that on the flip side and, and, and look at sort of the European GDP star over the last few years, which is Ireland, right? Mm. Um, and gross national income in Ireland has actually only gone up very slowly since the European financial crisis. Um, but because of sort of tax legislation and how Ireland books uh, is, a lot, is used by multinational corporations um, to book their corporate profits, Profit taxes for intellectual property and earnings outside of the United States. Um, Irish GDP looked like, I think in 2015, it went up 25%, 2017, 15%, right? Um, uh, and in Russia, you know, one important point to remember is that leaving aside the sort of GDP statistics in terms of gross national income and, and, and the basket of goods that the Russian consumer could buy, uh, the peak of essentially your average Russian's wealth on a power purchasing, a purchasing power parity measured scheme compared uh, to other countries is still 2013, and, and, and Russia has never gone back uh, to that level um, since the first invasion of Ukraine and initial sanctions in 2014. Uh, got close pre-COVID, um, still hasn't recovered, and, and um, remains at, at a level below that. And like I said, I, I don't think, even if we see changes in, you know, Russian, if oil prices go up 30, 40% last year, and next year, Russian GDP is going to grow by a few mm. percentage points. Um, is the purchasing power and, and, and the... Uh, PPP adjusted income of the average Russian going to go up? No. So in other words, the GDP in this case is not the best metric that show the impact of the sanctions. Um, yeah, I mean, if Russia's economy would collapse, you would see it in GDP figures, but it's not necessarily the best figure for um, measuring sanctions efficacy. Um, uh, it, it is certainly one, and, and you know, I don't think that we should um, excuse uh, our the assumptions because they did come from the highest levels of Western governments. You know, uh, President uh, Biden, you know, said it explicitly that yeah. he expected Russia's GDP to be crippled. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that saying that oh, well, looking at other statistics should be used as 
an excuse to say, well, did they actually believe that it would do that? Did they really believe that it would mm. um, be a, a one size fits all solution? Um, you know, how that got made at that uh, decision and how that was interpreted and briefed at that senior most level is obviously above my pay grade. Um, but, you know, I certainly have talked with a number of uh, officials and in, in sanctions authorities uh, and worked together with them in one way or another for, for many years, uh, whether that be in Europe, the United Kingdom, or the United States. Uh, and I don't think that that was the assumption of the actual sanctions policy makers mm. uh, themselves. Um, and I'm happy to discuss this further if you want, but I do think there were real changes in our understanding of how sanctions worked in between 2014 and 2022. Mm-hmm. So it was maybe the expected outcome was lost in translation a little bit. Well, I think that Sanctions were initially used against Russia um, as a tool to try to deter the Kremlin from further aggression. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to 2014, when the first sanctions were introduced, uh, again, the first major sanctions against Russia were introduced uh, by the West, the real sort of novel development was the implementation of what were called sectoral sanctions. First by the United States and then uh, after the MH17 disaster in which a flight from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur was shot down by Russian forces over eastern Ukraine, the European Union joined it as well. But what these sanctions did was that they uh, limited investment for certain companies or or for some Russian sectors, most notably um, fracking, offshore oil development, um, uh, and Western companies were barred from these. But also they included a notable tool to borrow to bar Russian companies from borrowing in Western capital markets that were affected. Um, and this was uh, caused a huge crisis for the Russian economy at the end of 2014 uh, with Rosneft, the Russian state oil company, uh, being bailed out uh, um, so that uh, it wouldn't be uh, affected by these sanctions, effectively forced into to a kind of bankruptcy. Um, the That greatly impoverished the Russian people. It's still the single largest uh, day collapse in the Russian ruble, except for the first day uh, um, after the war when markets went haywire, the full-scale invasion, I mean, uh, was this this effort to save um, Rosneft back in, in December of 2014. But um, I explained those to say that what the sanctions intended to do uh, was uh, to work as a deterrent tool. Say, look at what this power we have, and mm. if you keep... Um, having further aggression into Crimea uh, and, and into other parts of Ukraine, we can ratchet these up. Uh, the sanctions were in turn ratcheted up in a relatively coherent way under the Obama administration, an entirely incoherent way under the Trump administration. And then again, once the Biden administration, uh, after the victory in the 2020 election, um, reinstituted from its early stages that sort of signaling, you do X, we will result with sanction Y um, policy. And now... In my opinion, and I certainly think the sort of political science and the history backs this up, sanctions are not necessarily so effective at convincing an adversary not to do something, mm. right? Uh, we've had sanctions. The United States has had sanctions on Cuba for uh, 70 years almost now. Uh, the Cuban government has not taken policies that the United States would like. They don't do that in uh, North Korea. Most recently in Iran, of course, in 2018, you know, the Trump administration uh, reimposed sanctions on uh, Tehran that had been uh, suspended under the 2015 uh, JCPOA or Iran deal. Um, and rather than the new maximum pressure policy, yes, it caused significant economic difficulties for Iran and Iranians, but uh, Iran is closer to having a nuclear weapon now than it ever was before, and they're widely believed to have sort of a uh, maybe one month breakout capacity. Um, so those sanctions actually pushed Iran even more to do the policy mm. that, that the West didn't want it to do. Where sanctions are very effective, and this gets to some of the points that we were talking about earlier, even if they're not a you know super weapon that can destroy the economy of a uh, UN Security Council major commodities power to um, state like Russia, uh, is sanctions are really effective as a tool of war by other means. Um, and this gets back to, again, our sort of first discussions and where they go and why it's important. I think that the West can remain committed to this strategy. Um, but yes, they are a way of holding the Russian um, state uh, responsible for its action. They are uh, a way that the West can use um, its relative, the relative imbalance of power in its favor to hold Russia to account, to restrict it, to make it pay costs for its aggression uh, in Ukraine. Um, but they are not going to stop 
Russia from, or at least Putin from, um, waging that kind of conflict. It is possible, you know, in a more in a Russian system where there was more democratic accountability. Mm-hmm. Yes, I do think that that w- would be the case. Um, but uh, a lot of these sort of failures and failures to understand where sanctions work and where they don't work is also, uh, as well as the role of democratic states and non-democratic states in that equation, that led to a lot of the failures that we saw in European policymaking, in particular in Germany, um, where there was this sort of thought that, oh, the more we have economic interdependence with Russia, the less likely they will be to take major aggression. Um, And I think going back to that point about uh, Russian living standards not returning to their 2013 levels um, and Putin's level of security and power, um, unless the Russian economy is truly in, in... the major doldrums uh, and he can't continue to operate the relationships with the stakeholders uh, within the Kremlin and and within his own government that he has often managed through economic incentives. Um, Putin is just uh, not going, I I frankly don't think he cares um, Mm. about uh, the average wealth of the average Russian. He cares about um, how great a power Russia is far more than that. He may think that wealth flows from that, and there's certainly an argument to be made there, um, uh, but I would argue his strategy there has been vastly um, under performing and and a colossal failure when you consider how easy he assumed it would be uh, for Russia to take over Ukraine entirely, uh, as well as um, the knock-on costs that that's had for Russia reputationally, economically, politically, and and so forth, uh, not only uh, in the West, but in the wider international community.